All right. Well, happy Friday. Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us this morning for Coffee with the Collection. My name is Amanda and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. Before we get started, let's go over just a little housekeeping first. Everyone should be on mute right now and I'd like to ask you all to keep yourselves muted so we can hear our presenter without any distractions. But if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to do so using the chat feature. To open your chat, scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the icon that looks like a speech bubble. Once you click that window, uh, click that, a window will open to the side of your screen where you'll be able to type questions and comments, and we'll circle back around to those at the end of the presentation. We also have enabled uh, closed captioning. To access that feature, just click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and select Enable Subtitles. For our regular attendees, you may notice today things look a little bit different behind me this time. Uh, that's because we're getting special access to a brand new location, hasn't even opened yet, <laughs> for our new friends at Yellow Dog Coffee Company. It's a lovely shop already. I really can't wait to spend time in here, even outside of work. Um, and just to say hello, I'm going to turn my camera just a little bit um, to our friends. This is Rob, the coffee boss, and Lily, the manager here at Yellow hello. Dog Coffee. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for allowing us to be here today. And this is a really amazing, fancy coffee roaster behind me that you all can see. Um, I hope that as soon as they open, we'll let you all know and you have the chance to come on in and support one of Norman's finest local businesses. Uh, to get things started, I'd like to invite everyone to sit back, relax, grab your favorite cup of coffee. Hopefully you have with you this session's special roast created by our friends at Yellow Dog, uh, Cafe Domier, with a smoky sweet flavor that French coffee is known and loved for. This roast is available now um, through our friends at Yellow Dog Coffee Company and will continue to be available in their storefront and on their website after our program this morning. A link to their website should be in the chat now. Without any further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Courtney Hoffman. She will share insights about her research and how it relates to specific artworks in the museum's collection. Dr. Hoffman is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oklahoma. She received her BA and BS from the University of Notre Dame and her MAA and PhD from the University of Maryland. She is co-director of the Laboratories of Molecular Anthropology and Microbiome Research at OU, where her group utilizes genomics and proteomics to address the diverse ways in which humans have interacted with their environments over thousands of years. She has two mixed breed dogs, Ruby and Petra. Maybe we'll get to see them later. <laughs> uh, before I officially hand the reins over to Courtney, I would like to ask our audience members a question that everyone can answer by typing into the chat window I mentioned earlier. My question for you all is, when you think of dogs and art, is there a particular artwork at all that comes to your mind? If one does, go ahead and type that in the chat now. I always think of dogs playing poker. I, I'm sure there's better artworks out there, but that's the first one that comes to my mind. <laughs> Um, while everyone is sharing with each other, I'm going to go ahead, Courtney, and hand things over to you. And thank you again for being here and joining us today. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for that introduction. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, dogs and my own work on dogs. Um, my dog is currently napping, but maybe she'll uh, visit us at some point during Zoom. So. When we think about dogs, it's really interesting because dogs, um, the ancestor of dogs is this wolf, but how did we get from this to this? These look really different. They behave differently, but actually um, this happened on a very short time scale when we think of evolution. And there's two different processes that are ongoing with dogs. The first was initial domestication, when we brought wolves um, into human spheres of influence and started to change their biology, their behavior, their physical body shape. And this process is called domestication. The second process is much more recent, and this is called diversification. So most dog breeds that we have are only um, had been around since the Victorian period. 
So uh, if you think about all the physical diversity in dog um, body shape and size and behavior um, from this German Shepherd to Beagles to Airedale Terriers to Bulldogs, most of those changes have happened because humans have selected particular behaviors or phenotypes or physical um, looks of a dog uh, for particular activities, whether that be hunting or herding or even companionship. So if we step back into time and, and go to this first event, the dog domestication event, um, we have to really think about how this might have happened and what that means for studying it in the past. So these are uh, two skulls. Um, the one on the left is a, a canid from Goyette Cave. And the skull itself is about 31,000 years ago. And on the right, you see a, a model of a gray wolf um, skull. And if you look closely, they're pretty similar. Um, maybe the Goyette Cave canid has a little bit of a shorter snout. Um, the teeth look pretty similar. The um, uh, crania look pretty similar. And this 31,000 year old canid skull is uh, debated as one of potentially the earliest dogs. And the reason why people think it might have been a dog is because it was found in an intentional burial. Um, and so it was in this cave site, it was buried. And so that suggests that there is this human connection to that particular animal. Um, uh, most um, dog biologists think that domestication actually happened much later um, and that this could just be a wolf and it could be a wolf because we don't have a really good sense of the variation in wolves that lived at this time period in Europe. So uh, most dog domestication folks think that it happened around 15,000 years ago, which is much um, more recent than this uh, canid here that could have been a wolf, it could have been a dog, it could have been a wolf that someone kept as a pet. But by um, 15,000 years ago, we definitely have distinctive dogs. Um, and uh, this cave art here, rock art, is from about 8,000 years ago in Saudi Arabia. And if we think about the images that you see here, um, if you look closely, there are large um, herding animals here, there are people, and then you can see dogs kind of sprinkled throughout here that are helping uh, with this herding um, of these larger animals here. We zoom in further, you can actually see that some of these dogs are on leashes 8,000 years ago in Saudi Arabia, which is really amazing that um, we have these images that have uh, survived for 8,000 years and depict uh, a behavior that we still use today, which is keeping our dogs on leashes. And in fact, some of these dogs actually look like dogs that exist in the region today. These are canine dogs and they have these pricked ears, short snouts, um, a deeply angled chest and curled tails. They also have this white coloration on the chest that's depicted in the art here and here. So this is a really amazing example of, and it gives us insight into uh, what and how people interacted with dogs 8,000 years ago. Um, and we can use art like this to inform our understanding of the way people connected with their animals. But there's other ways to do that too, um, to learn about humans' uh, relationships with animals in the past. And uh, I co-direct the Laboratories in Molecular Anthropology and Microbiome Research at OU which is an ancient DNA uh, research facility and it's one of the biggest in the United States. Um, and so we uh, use ancient DNA from bones and teeth of animals to reconstruct 
where they came from, how they connected to people, and how they have changed over thousands of years. And so our lab is in the Stevenson's Research and Technology Center down on the research campus by um, the Lloyd Noble. Um, and we have to uh, use uh, specialized facilities because anytime you touch something or you know you scratch yourself or whatnot you're shedding DNA that could potentially contaminate um, an ancient bone or tooth that has degraded DNA. The DNA is chopped into tiny pieces and so that's why we wear these Tyvek suits. We have work in a special play room that has UV light overhead um, so once we leave that space we can uh, sanitize it and, and, and break down any DNA. Um, so what you see here in the left is our ancient DNA lab with uh, UV lights. And right down here is our ancient DNA lab. And then we actually have a modern genetics lab that's up on this floor. But a lot of um, ancient DNA researchers have focused on dogs because they're, you know, they're, they're such an important part of our lives today. And one of the really cool findings about ancient DNA and dogs is understanding how um, dogs have moved and colonized the Americas. And so this really amazing study came out in 2018 that sequenced DNA from um, really old dogs in North America and was able to propose a uh, a hypothesis for how dogs colonized uh, the Americas. And they proposed that there were four introductions. The first uh, being that dogs uh, arrived with uh, the human migration 17 to 13,000 years ago um, and across the Bering Sea and into um, North America and, and, and down into South America. And so when people moved into these landscapes, they brought with them the resources and, and the companions that would have been really important for them. And that includes dogs. The second um, potential introduction was uh, much later, is about a thousand years ago. And it came again across the, the Bering um, Strait and into um, northern North America and into Greenland. And this is the Thule introduction of uh, dogs. And so Greenland dogs are pretty unique. And it's thought that they arrived as a result of this migration about a thousand years ago. The third introduction event um, was the arrival of European dogs in beginning in 1492, um, when Columbus arrived in the Americas. And, and this had a transformative um, impact on indigenous dogs that were in the Americas. Um, basically, there are very few dog breeds that exist today that are remnants of um, indigenous dogs. There's a couple exceptions like the Carolina dog um, and the Sholos, uh, but most indigenous dogs went extinct upon the arrival of European dogs. And the last introduction, um, which was very recent, was the introduction of huskies uh, associated with the gold rush. So huskies are, have only been in North America since about 1900. Some of these dog breeds that went extinct were really unique. Um, so for example, the Salish woolly dog was a larger version of Pomeranian um, and it went extinct by the 1900s. And these dogs were raised in the Pacific Northwest for their hair. Um, they were shorn like sheep and the, the hair was used for blankets um, before about 1862 when sheep became more common. Um, so these really cute Salish woolly dogs don't exist anymore. There's maybe one um, in a museum collection, but we don't, we just don't have much information about them anymore. Another dog that actually survived um, the arrival of European dogs uh, is the Sholo, uh, Sholos Quintili, which is a Mexican dog breed that still exists today. Um, and there's hairless and haired forms. Uh, Frida Kahlo was very famous for her Sholo dogs um, and they have been depicted in art for a very long time. So Amanda, take it away. Thanks, Courtney. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of those depictions in the museum's collection. So here we have a ceramic representation of the Sholo from about 200 to 300. 
Similar ceramic canine figurines have been found in ancient shaft tombs throughout Mesoamerica and primarily in Colima, which is a state in Western Mexico. Colima dog figurines were often left in tombs to assist the deceased on their journey into the underworld. Uh, many cultural groups believe that if you were kind to your dog while you were alive, then your dog would assist you into the afterlife by allowing you to grab a hold of their tail while they tow you through a body of water to the land of the dead. Uh, other accounts tell of a guard dog that protects the gates to the afterlife who could be easily pacified with tortillas. I think I could easily be pacified with tortillas. <laughs> um, but most Kalima dogs, such as this object in the museum's collection, have short legs, round bodies, perky ears, and are covered in a red clay slip. Uh, thank you. Uh, some of these figurines were depicted with wrinkles in their skin, which indicates that these dogs did not have any fur, as Courtney showed us in a previous slide. Um, others have been shown with human characteristics. The one pictured here appears to be smiling, although I think you could almost say it looks a little like a grimace, but I believe it's meant to be uh, understood as a smile. The dogs of Mesoamerica were seen as equals and served important roles in everyday life. At this time, animals that are traditionally used as food sources, such as cows, pigs, or sheep, did not inhabit the area. So in order to supplement a primarily plant-based diet, um, some dogs were specifically bred as a food source, along with turkey and duck. So the dogs that were bred as a food source were often fattened with leftover table scraps. And perhaps this is alluded to with the figurine's round belly that we can see that just barely touches the ground. Uh, these dogs served a variety of purposes. Some were kept as pets and would never have been eaten. Some were used as watchdogs. Others were used to transport goods. And some were even used as therapy dogs. Um, I read that the hot body of the dog would act as a warm compress that you could hold against your body when you have an ache or a pain. I certainly wouldn't mind being prescribed a warm dog the next time I'm not feeling well. <laughs> Um, however unlikely that is. Uh, Courtney, can you go ahead and move to the next slide? So dogs in the past have been used in a variety of ways. And as with the Klima dog, dogs have been used in food. This is um, a dog bone um, from an archeological site in Europe. And what you can see on it is that there are cut marks. And these cut marks suggest that the dog was prepared um, for consumption. Um, if you were going to um, uh, bury your friend, uh, your companion, you probably wouldn't um, use uh, a, a blade to cut it up. So this suggests, and then you can look at what bones have cut marks to try to understand how an animal was being prepared. Was it being prepared for skinning um, for the fur or was it going to be consumed? And, and then in this study, they found that these dogs were probably being prepared for consumption. Um, and so dogs weren't just companion animals, but today they are. You know, we often, people buy backpacks to carry their dogs. But in the past, dogs were used uh, to carry our stuff. Uh, and this was especially so um, before the introduction of horses to North America by Europeans. And so uh, dogs um, were used with travois, um, which you see in kind of the upper right here and lower right, where these dogs have um, loads that they're carrying on. And this was very common on the plains. And then there's the classic sled dogs, um, which we often think of when we think of dogs as transports. And if you look closely in this photo, um, none of these dogs really look like huskies, um, which we think of as a classic sled dog. But if you remember, um, huskies weren't introduced into um, the Americas until about the 1900s. So there were other dogs that were um, primarily sled dog type animals um, that existed in, in the Americas before huskies arrived. Um, so here we have an example of a depiction of working dog relationships um, and another artwork in the museum. So while the title of this piece is Coiled Pictorial Polychrome Basket, it is more than likely um, that this was actually a wastebasket that was created in West Central Alaska and made to be sold uh, to tourists. 
So this basket was made by a Yupik artist in the 1940s. The Yupik are a group of indigenous peoples of Western, Southwestern, and South Central Alaska, as well as the Russian Far East. The traditional way of life of the Yupik was semi-nomadic as they traveled based on seasonal changes in the environment. Hunting sea mammals such as seals and fishing were life-sustaining activities. And depicted in careful detail that we can see on this basket shows important moments from everyday life for the Yupik. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a close-up view of the sled being pulled by two sled dogs. Um, something else that I want to mention with this photo that we can see really well is that the, the structure of the basket was formed first and then the figurative and uh, animal details were added after the form was created. So almost kind of like in the same technique as um, embroidery, something like that. So added on top of. Uh, next slide. Um, on the image on the bottom left corner, we see a depiction of an individual in a kayak or a fishing boat, and he is holding a spear. Perhaps this is a walrus hunter or uh, maybe hunting for seals. It's interesting that in this basket, we are shown two representations of the main modes of transportation for the Yupik by boat and by sled, one of which would not be possible without the assistance of sled dogs. Uh, next slide, please. And now let's take a look at a completely different role for canines in their relationships with humans. And that is the pet companion aspect as comically represented in this print in the museum's collection by Honoré Daumier. Daumier, born in 1808 and died in 1879, was a prolific French painter, sculptor, and printmaker whose many works were illustrative commentaries on the social and political life in France. This print, and I'm not going to attempt uh, to say the French, so I'll just say the English translation. Um, since he is now part of the family, he must also have his portrait taken. Shows a dog seated in the lap of a woman having her portrait made. The dog here takes on not only the role of pet and companion, but also an integral member of the family. The dog's posture and attitude that Daumier so effortlessly displays mimics in almost exact detail that of the woman sitter. They are both erect, with upright posture, neither one is leaning back, the woman is not reclining into her chair, and the dog, in turn, is not reclining or resting comfortably on her lap. Both are in profile, and the dog's snout seems to almost comically reference the woman's nose. In this print, Daumier may be poking a little bit of fun at the upper class relationship to one's pet. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and now let's take a look at an artist whose relationship to his canine friends fueled an entire artistic career. Chances are you have seen photographs much like these two somewhere before. Perhaps on a popular dog calendar, children's books, an episode of Sesame Street, the cover of the New Yorker magazine, or even perhaps an episode of Saturday Night Live. These particular Weimariners have brought just as much fame and notoriety to their breed as they have to the artist William Wegman, whose artistic career has been defined by these images. His extensive au revoir began in 1970 with a newspaper ad for Weimariner puppies that caught his attention. His first of the breed, named Man Ray, was brought to his studio simply as a companion. Man Ray would constantly follow Wegman everywhere in his studio, begging for his attention, and was unusually interested in what the artist was doing. One day, uh, the dog sat in front of Wegman's camera and finally became very calm and still, inspiring the artist to begin the series that would extend the entire length of his career. Many of the photographic images Wegman has created over the years with different Weimariners, but all from the same family, sometimes reference nods or critiques to art history on the image on the left, sometimes silly, and sometimes resonate with a melancholic beauty, always pointing to something else hidden just behind the, our surface understanding of these images. Wegman describes his work as the process of becoming. It's not just the dog in the photograph, and it's not simply a dog pretending to be something it is not, but a dog transforming becoming and reflecting our own human nature. Uh, next slide, please. In the late 1980s, Wegman acquired his second Weimariner puppy, Fay Ray, pictured here in this photograph in the museum's collection. While with Man Ray, Wegman was like a boy with his dog, 
But with Fay Ray, he became artist and muse. In this photograph, simply titled Fay Ray in Boots, we are immediately struck by the glistening gray coat of the dog, who stares intently behind him at something that has caught his attention. Oddly enough, in the same direction that the boots he is wearing are pointing, almost as if the shoes themselves are responding, trying to walk toward what is happening just outside the picture frame on the right, while the dog appears to have been momentarily stopped from moving in the opposite direction. It's easy to project moments like this that we've all experienced, simultaneously coming and going, caught in a hesitation before making a final decision. This projecting of our own humanness onto our canine friends that Wegman points to can also be found most recently in social media trends featuring very human interpretations of quote unquote bad dog behaviors. Courtney, I'm gonna hand this back to you. Yeah, when I think of that, um of the Wegman dogs. I really think of it, how it kind of just created this um, need and desire to share our pets and share our pets in, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and this trend from a couple years ago of pet shaming and more recently just uh, TikTok and Instagram famous pets where people become, you know, really invested in the lives of uh, animals that they don't have a physical connection to, um, but uh, might have a deep personal meaning um, where, you know, they try to go and visit those animals if they're at some trade show or things like that. Um, and, and my own dog has, has been quite naughty and here she is um, with an exam that she stole when she was a puppy and, and destroyed um, and so I have my own version of these pet shaming um, photos as a most, most dog owners um, might. But I really think that the, uh, in my own view, that these Wegman dogs and, and these, this movement of thinking about dogs as companion animals, and it's changed the way we think about our relationships with our pets and, and how we share them with other people um, through social media, through sending photos to your family members and all sorts of ways like pet shaming and, 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 and TikTok today. So I think um, we'll leave it there and we'll make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Yeah, go ahead and do that now if you have any or any comments um, for Courtney. But Courtney, while people are thinking of those or typing things in, I do have a question for you. Um, so we mentioned earlier in the very beginning, you know, working in the lab at OU, and I was curious what kind of dogs do you all work on um, there in particular? Yeah, so uh, one of my graduate students has been working on Mesoamerican dogs uh, from Teotihuacan, which is an ancient city um, in Mexico. It's about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Mexico City. Um, and so she has been looking at uh, the relationships between uh, animals at that site, um, including ritually sacrificed animals, but also dogs. And um, they, there are wolves in ritual contexts, but dogs in non-ritual contexts. And so, but there's also some koi dogs going on, some interbreeding with coyotes. And so trying to tease that part is part of her dissertation research. Very cool. Um, so, I'm, I'm kind of curious too, a little bit, you know, as a uh, molecular biologist and, you know, there's probably lots of different directions like you could go with that. <laughs> and I wonder like what your, um, you talked a little bit in the beginning about why researching and looking at canines is important to understanding uh, where we are today. But I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak just a little bit more about that or, or if you have, you know, personal reasons for wanting to investigate you know, dogs in particular. Yeah, well, dogs have been really important in human history. Um, they were the first domesticated animal um, that we have uh, knowledge of. And so it, it understanding what happened both at domestication, um, when we changed our relationship with wolves and, and created domestic dogs, to diversification when we bred all these different breeds um, much more recently has um, really important 
ways of thinking about the way humans interact with their environments. Dogs are also a really interesting model for cancer because um, we know they came from a common origin, they were all domesticated, but we've done so many different things to them um, through human selection that we can start to see, compare diseases between dog breeds and understand like what the underlying biology is between those cancers or diseases, like, you know, golden retrievers get some diseases that German shepherds don't. Um, in my own work, um, I uh, actually did my dissertation research on foxes. And uh, these foxes come from the Channel Islands in California. They're only found there. Um, and they may have actually been introduced by ancient peoples. And so my dissertation work was looking at how um, people uh, might have introduced the foxes to these islands um, and had a relationship with them. So where, what kind of archeological sites we find them in and, and what are the context of that? So I used ancient DNA and zooarchaeology to try to tease apart that human animal dynamic of an animal that we don't typically think of as a pet. Um, and so one of, I often had to turn to looking at dogs and the way we think about dogs as companions and dogs in the archeological record as a proxy for saying, if we find the same patterns in dogs and foxes, then they, these foxes might've had a similar relationship to humans as dogs had to humans. So. It's fascinating. I had never thought about it like that. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Let's see if I can scroll back up here. Okay, so the first one, Heidi asks, what are the differences between the ancient North American dogs and the ones that came later, and why did they become extinct? So the ancient North American dogs, um, the, we can tell the difference between um, which migration they came from based on uh, their genetic data. So the ones that came over on the first migration, um, as people spread across the Americas, so did the dogs and the companions that they brought with them. Um, and so over those 15,000 years or so, they created breeds appropriate to different ecoregions in the Americas. Um, so for example, in Mexico, they created uh, Sholo dogs, which are, um, you know, the Kalima dog that we saw today. Um, in the Northwest Coast, they were interested in having the more Salish uh, dogs and you were using them for a different function. So uh, they went extinct in a lot of ways because they were replaced by European dogs. European dogs came in and interbred with them, but also, um, there, there's aspects of control that occurred in the breeding of animals when animals were introduced in the Americas to um, uh, create environments that were more European-like that uh, prevented um, indigenous dogs from um, persisting, basically. And so sometimes um, people will think they have a Carolina dog, they'll do a DNA test and it will look like the Carolina dog, which is one of the indigenous dog breeds that still kind of persisted in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, and, it, and it isn't, or it has a very small percentage of Carolina dog DNA left in it. Um, so we have another question. Susanna asks, are you conducting similar research on cats or felines? Um, my graduate student who's working at Teotihuacan is also working on jaguars and pumas that have been ritually sacrificed um, at the, in those contexts. So not, not domestic cats. Um, I'm a dog person, so I, I haven't done as much work on uh, cats, but there is ancient DNA work ongoing on cats. And I think a couple years ago, there was a paper out of a lab in France that tried to look at the, um, the origins of um, cat in um, moving them around the world. Absolutely. So kind of related to that, uh, Haven has more, more of a statement than a question, um, which she even says here. Uh, but she says she has owned both dogs and cats, and all, um, I'll bet there's nothing comparable about cats. And she says they dislike any training. They didn't invent themselves. Very true. And it is not possible to shame them. Um, 
I have a cat also, so even yeah, <laughs> I completely agree with that statement slash question. <laughs> Yeah, I've never tried to train a cat, and I don't. I don't have a cat, but uh, I imagine it'd be pretty hard to shame them. Absolutely, my dog <laughs> certainly looks upset when when she knows she did something naughty. <laughs> right. Yeah, I I think a cat has a very different outlook on doing something naughty. It's kind of like, are you watching me do this? Do you see? <laughs> I'm almost, you know, kind of having a good time with it. <laughs> Um, well, if no one else has any other questions or comments, we'll go ahead and wrap things up a little bit early. Um, so uh, I want to thank you, Courtney, for taking the time this morning to speak with us and sharing all of the information about the fascinating work that you do with the lab here in OU and in your professional career. It's been a real treat for us at the museum to work with you. Um, and a special thank you to Yellow Dog Coffee Company. Uh, we'll say goodbye to Lily real quick <laughs> um, for partnering with us and creating the delicious Domier's Cafe, as well as for allowing us a sneak peek into your coffee shop. Um, we're really excited to be working with you all on this program. And of course, thank you to our audience members for joining us this morning. If you haven't had a chance to register for the next Coffee with the Collection, um, a link for that should be in the chat now. And that session will be Friday, July 22nd at 9.30 a.m. Museum curator Dr. Hadley German will be back uh, to share insights into an intriguing aspect of one of the museum's most well-known paintings, Portrait of Alexander Reed by Vincent Van Gogh. It should be a really great conversation. We hope to see you in July. So, all right, well, have a wonderfully creative weekend, everyone. Stay cool and stay safe. Thank you.